Four thousand years have passed since Abraham walked upon this earth, but his story lives on, and his legacy is rich and powerful. His story is found on the pages of ancient Hebrew sacred text, and his family tree has branched into three great monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They revere him as a spiritual role model of devotion and obedience to the one true God. God made a covenant agreement with Abraham, promising a son, descendants outnumbering the stars and a new land to call home. Over his lifetime, Abraham was both greatly blessed and rigorously tested by God. Just 11 chapters in to this sacred and historical book, Abraham's story unfolds. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. Abraham, first called Abram, lived during the early part of the second millennium BCE. He was born in Ur, located in the southern part of Mesopotamia, present-day Iraq. Polytheism, the worship of many gods, was culturally popular and widely practiced. For example, Nana, the moon god, was worshipped at the ziggurat of Ur. Abram's father Terah made statues of these gods called idols. Early on, Abram rejected the polytheistic religion in favor of worshipping the one true god. The Talmud tells of Abram smashing every one of his father's idols with a stick, claiming the idols were powerless and worshipping them worthless. In Genesis, Abram's story jumps from his birth announcement to his wedding vows. Abram married his sweetheart Sarah. She was stunningly beautiful, but sadly barren. Next, Terah decided to move his family to the land of Canaan. Following the rivers rather than cross the vast desert, the journey was long and travel slow. Reaching Haran, they stopped and settled. Many years pass. Now Abram's father, Terah, died in Haran at the age of 205. Abram became patriarch of the tribe. He was age 75 and Sarah 65. Now God called Abram. Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Abram obeyed God. Arriving in Canaan, they pitched their tents on the side of a mountain near Bethel. However, it wasn't long before a famine forced Abram to pick up and move again. They headed south for the Nile River in Egypt. But Abram was worried. He feared they would kill him to acquire his beautiful wife, Sarah. So he convinced Sarah to go along with a lie and tell the Pharaoh they were siblings. In truth, Sarah was Abram's half-sister. They had the same father but different mothers. Sarah was taken in by the Egyptian Pharaoh, and Abram was favored with gifts of sheep, oxen, donkey, and male and female servants. This deception was short-lived, however, as God intervened, making everyone sick in the Egyptian palace. Pharaoh's eyes were open to the truth, and he hastily returned Sarah to her rightful place and ordered them away from Egypt. Abram, Sarah, and Lot left Egypt and settled back near Bethel. By this time, Abram and Lot's estates had grown so large they needed to separate. Abram unselfishly set aside his rights as elder and gave Lot first pick of the land. Lot chose the fertile valley of Sodom and Gomorrah, despite their reputation of sin. Abram moved his tents to the Oaks of Mamre in Hebron and built a rough stone altar there as a reminder of God's protection. Now, in Canaan, a power struggle had been brewing between the ruling kings, and war eventually broke out. Sodom and Gomorrah were conquered and all the people and possessions taken, including Lot and his family. Learning of Lot's captivity, 
Abram led his 318 trained men in a successful search and rescue. Returning with Lot and all the people and possessions, Abram was met by Melchizedek, who was not only the king of Salem, but also a priest of the God Most High. Melchizedek brought bread and wine, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom also approached Abram and told him to keep all the goods and possessions as a reward. But let the people return to Sodom. Abram refused the king's riches. Abram was a model of compassion, leadership in battle, and diplomacy as he achieved his war objective but did not keep anything or harm anyone. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram lamented about not having a son, an heir. Abram asked God if Eleazar, his eldest and most trusted servant, would be his heir. So God took Abram outside and again promised Abram that he would father an heir and have descendants as numerous as the stars in the night sky. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. Now Sarah, being barren and yet longing to be a mother and give Abram a son, fulfilling God's promise, made a difficult decision. Sarah surrendered her husband to Hagar, her Egyptian maidservant. After conceiving, Hagar became haughty and looked down on Sarah. Conflict escalated between the two women, and Hagar ran away into the desert. Alone, frightened, and pregnant, Hagar sobbed. God heard and sent an angel to comfort and convince Hagar to go back and submit to Sarah's authority. Hagar responded, you are a God who sees me. Hagar gave birth to Ishmael, and Abram became a father at age 86. Great joy must have filled their tents that day. Abram and Sarah surely believed Ishmael's birth had fulfilled God's promise. Therefore, when God Almighty appeared to Abram thirteen years later and said the promised son was yet to come through Sarah, he must have been very surprised. God changed Abram's name to Abraham, which means father of a multitude of nations. God also commanded Abraham to circumcise himself and all the men and boys of his household. This new tradition was a physical sign of the covenant agreement between them. Abraham obeyed God. That very day, Abraham, Ishmael, and all the males of the household were circumcised. During this divine encounter, Abraham, filled with compassion, prayed, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of twelve rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. Soon after, as Abraham was resting at the entrance of his tent, three strangers suddenly appeared. Abraham ran to meet them, then told Sarah, and ran to select a choice calf. He hurried to prepare it and served the strangers, who turned out to be divine messengers, on a mission from God. Abraham was given some good news and bad news. The good news was an assurance that he and Sarah would have a son. Sarah, who had been listening nearby, laughed and thought to herself, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? The Lord heard and said, Is anything too hard for the Lord? 
The bad news was God's plan to wipe away Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham was deeply concerned for his nephew Lot and prayed in earnest, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? God remembered Abraham. Before the sinful people of Sodom and Gomorrah were struck down, God sent angelic messengers to warn Lot, urging him to get up and out of the city or die. But incredibly, Lot hesitated. So God's messengers seized Lot, his wife, and two daughters and pulled them out of their home and away from the city. But still Lot's wife looked back and was turned to a pillar of salt. The next morning, Abraham saw the smoke rising from the valley where Sodom and Gomorrah used to be. Turning around, he headed south, away from the destruction. The next year, just as God had said, Sarah miraculously gave birth to a son and named him Isaac. Mere words could not describe the incredible joy they felt that day. The baby boy grew at his mother's side. Then one day, Sarah caught Ishmael mocking Isaac with disrespect. Was it sibling rivalry between the two brothers? Or perhaps having to share his parents' love and attention for the first time was difficult for Ishmael, even as a teenage boy. Regardless, Sarah's protective instincts emerged and she demanded Ishmael and his mother be sent away. Abraham was distressed and prayed. God told Abraham not to worry and to do as Sarah asked. Abraham obeyed God. Rising early the next morning, Abraham embraced Ishmael before sending him away with his mother. Wandering aimlessly through the wilderness, it wasn't long before the skin of water dried up. Ishmael lay down faint from dehydration. Tears streaming down his face, Hagar had given up hope. But God heard Ishmael and miraculously revealed a well of water. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. Many years passed. Now God tested Abraham with an impossible request. God said, Take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Prompt obedience, even under such trying circumstances, always characterized Abraham's response to God. Rising early, he and Isaac set off. As father and son walked, Isaac asked where the lamb was for the burnt offering. Abraham said the lamb would come from God himself. Arriving at Mount Moriah, Abraham went through the motions of preparing a burnt offering. Only this time the offering was his beloved son. The knife was raised, ready to strike. Just in the nick of time, the voice of an angel broke through this nightmarish scene. Abraham, Abraham, do not lay a hand on the boy. He released the boy, and together they sacrificed the ram that God provided. Then they headed home, weary but grateful. Some speculate that the thought of losing her son was too great a burden and hastened Sarah's death. Sarah lived 127 years and then died. Abraham mourned and wept for Sarah. Then, through negotiations with the Hittites, Abraham purchased land for the first time in order to properly bury his wife. Sarah's final resting place was in the field and the cave of Machpelah, facing the oaks of Mamre near Hebron in the promised land of Canaan. The final chapter of Abraham's life is recorded in Genesis chapter 25. Abraham takes another wife, Keturah, and they have six sons. This chapter also gives an account of Abraham's descendants through his son Ishmael, the twelve princes and their nations, and through his son Isaac, the twelve tribes of Israel. Abraham lived 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. Mourning the death of their father, his sons Isaac and Ishmael came together and buried him in the cave of Machpelah with his dear wife Sarah. Abraham lived a life of great faith. Through a covenant agreement with God Most High, Abraham was guided, protected, tested, and richly blessed. Abraham's legacy of trust and obedience to the one true God has influenced countless generations. Judaism and Christianity and Islam 
are all branches of Abraham's family tree. Thus Abraham did become the father of a multitude of nations, and has descendants outnumbering the stars.